This episode of the Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling Review is brought to you by Draft. Draft is the best way, the most enjoyable way, and the most profitable way to play fantasy sports in a snake draft format. You can play football, baseball, hockey, golf, or basketball. Hit up playdraft.com backslash BQ to get in on the action with a free $3 entry upon your first deposit. Hey, what's up, everybody? BQ here along with Ro. Welcome to the Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling Review. I am in the driver's seat one more time. Adam is out of commission a little bit longer. Hopefully everything uh, goes well with him and we get him back here on the show again soon. But I'm uh, filling in once again, talking in another episode of Impact Wrestling. Um, this one was probably not uh, one of the better ones. Wasn't wasn't too bad. And we'll get into it shortly. As always, if you're looking for other Impact Wrestling podcasts to uh, listen to, the Heelcast and Pro Wrestling Personified podcast. Also, um, check out the Clock Cleaners. They do a really good job as well. Um, haven't haven't brought that one to your guys' attention yet. Maybe some of you already listened to him, but um, he does a real good job with his show. So check out uh, the Clock Cleaners. And um, if you're listening on uh, iTunes, Podbean, whatever it is, and you don't, if you're not a subscriber yet on YouTube, definitely check out the Impact Lounge on YouTube. Lots of really good things going on. Just uh, sat down with Congo Kong today for about 45 minutes. Had a really great interview. And uh, got a few good ones lined up as well. And just wherever you're listening, uh, hit that subscribe button. Would be much appreciated. And trying to do good things for Impact Wrestling. So, Impact Wrestling this week. Ro, what do you got on this one as a whole? Yeah, no, I found it to be entertaining. Like, I can't remember the last time I've laughed so much. And I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, It was a solid show. You know, nothing like we've seen past two three episodes but um yeah entertaining right um there's there's several parts i found were really entertaining too and there were times i actually sat and laughed watching this i like comedy i don't like bad comedy i like i like comedy when it's natural and then someone's not trying and there were some moments here i thought was just like good natural comedy but uh kind of a safe episode overall and one thing, I don't even think I finished saying exactly what I was trying to tell you before the show came on, but it seems like they almost alternate. So there's a show that's there, you know, using their terminology is stacked and they have, you know, a bunch of titles on the line and, and the main eventers up in there. And then they have an episode that's like more mid card wrestling, wrestling heavy, you know, and, and those are the ones that don't seem to do as well. I could tell we were in for a long night just based off the opening segment and the crowd. I, I knew this was not going to be one of the good Impact Zone crowds. I could tell that within the first five minutes of the show. Um, wasn't sure if this was a second half of tapings. I, th- I want to say it probably was because the crowd was a little thinner and uh, looked like it was the same clothes from last week that people were wearing. So I think it was just uh, late in the day. But let's get into this opening segment. They've been doing a really good job with, with kicking off the shows for the most part with wrestling and they went to the se- to a talking segment here. Alberto El Patron comes out saying the same old stuff. He's been talking about the paper champion and Eli Drake's not even in the picture anymore. And he's still talking about him and it, it, he's really just saying the same old stuff. I think he even said at one point, you guys know me. I don't talk. I fight like this dude has cut the longest promos since, you know, in the last year, is cut the longest possible promos he he could. And I remember Bound for Glory, him talking for what damn near felt like an eternity. Long promo a couple weeks ago, long promo this time too. So opening segment really didn't do much for me. Um, You know, they're trying to build uh, heat with this feud, but there's really not a lot of heat there. You know, there was shoving the meat in his face and everything. Uh, You know, other than that, I don't understand why these guys don't like each other. What do you got on the opening segment? You know, for one, with El Patron, his character kind of confuses me because I want to say, you know, he's a heel, but you see him, like, even when he came out uh, this episode, I want to say he had uh, shook a couple of hands, and, you know, he does a sea chant from time to time. <laughs> yeah. And that's what throws me off, like, you know, what I, get, I don't know if he's trying to play in between or whatever. The one thing I will say 
it, it feels like this is something that was kind of thrown together and it's been all right, but I feel, and, and I don't know, and you, I want your take on this. The longer their, their conversation goes, the interaction between him and Austin Aries, I feel like Austin Aries is getting the better of him on the mic. Like, it seems like when it runs on long, long, longer, 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 um, Austin Aries will say something. It's kind of like he kind of stumps uh, El Patron, where El Patron will kind of, I don't want to say stumble on his words, but like doesn't really know what to say. So I feel like Austin Aries is getting the better of him in on the mic. Yeah, because Aries is bringing, every time he comes out there and he talks, he's bringing something new to the table. And Alberto is just, as I said earlier, it's just the same stick he's just saying the same stuff and i put him over quite a bit on the show where i say you know he he works with the plays of the crowd well and he's been, been putting on good matches so i'm not one of the people that dislike him by any stretch but it's just the same crap and it's funny you brought out you brought up him slapping hands on the way to the ring and everything i talked about it on the one night only review he had a match um him and austin aries were on opposite teams this fool came through the crowd like damn near like trying to be Roman Reigns you know like he I mean he came out the the entrance but then he just like hopped the rail and just started going through the crowd and slapping hands and ccc like that's all babyface stuff so I don't I don't understand his character either it's not clear cut at all yeah and then like I said with this feud it just seems you know basically we got a pay-per-view match out of this just off of their first interaction together well, you know, where the sit down that they had last week, and I thought the whole feud was based off of, you know, El Patron targeting Austin Aries for being a vegan, hence why we got the whole, you know, don't you want to eat this meat type thing. So just weird, but I I think it's all right. But I think as they move forward, the interactions they might want to cut the mic time down because Austin Aries is really getting you know getting the better of uh, El Patron on the mic. I will say I did like the end where he had the music playing when it went, when, when uh, he said, let's cue, cue his music up. And I thought that whole bit was pretty good. I thought that was, uh, that was kind of original. So after this, we get the first match of the evening. Very, very random uh, matchup. Falaba versus Trevor Lee. Falaba continues to be over. He's having a lot of fun out there now. And when he was a heel, you know, we talked about it numerous times. Like this guy could be a monster, but he was doing comedy heel stuff and I didn't really like it but now as a baby face doing pretty much the same exact routine I actually find it funny and enjoyable and he's having some good matches I I kind of jumped out of my seat for a second when he when he landed on Trevor Lee's chest do you know what I'm talking about yeah like the bonsai drop style like my five-year-old I, I don't know how much five-year-olds weigh 40 pounds whatever he does that to me sometimes when I'm just laying on the ground and like that shit knocks the wind out of me and just like I I can't I, I just can't fathom like someone that size doing that and not like really hurting somebody yeah it's one of those things even when you think about when he I don't I can't recall when he's done it but I know his finisher is the one off of um, the middle the middle rope and you know I wonder I'm like to take that move man that's got to be tough you know especially for a guy that big big of size but you know, credit to the performers. Falabaz has kind of been a star lately in his own right. He gets a lot of offense in. Um, you know, he, he does not job out by any means. When somebody beats him, and this is going back to even EC3, when they had the Grand Championship match, they, they have to cheat to beat him, which maybe that's a good thing because he's a, he's a pretty big guy. But, you know, EC3, remember he put the foot up, feet on the ropes. Um, Sammy Callahan, uh, I know he... I want to say he did something in that match. I want to say it was kind of a dirty finish. I could be wrong. I know he, like, Samoan dropped him or something. Um, and then this one. This ended with a dirty finish. It almost looked like Trevor Lee was going to lose the match. Okay, I, I know they just had a feud with LAX. But this guy's a multi-time X Division champion. And I really think he didn't come out dominant out there. And he even had Tre uh, Caleb, Caleb Colley in his corner. What do you think about the way Falaba is being booked? Because he doesn't win. But he doesn't job out by any any sense either. My only problem has been with some of the losses that he's taken. Like, and I, I know you had mentioned this before, and obviously now it's not such a big deal. But 
you know, it seems like anybody can, like, even in the this case, you know, the finish where we saw Trevor Lee throw, well, I don't want to say throw him, but, you know, pretty much launch him off the turnbuckle. And I feel like that should be something that larger wrestlers are able to pull off with against Fall of Ball since he's a bigger guy. But we've seen, you know, back-to-back weeks because we saw with Callahan as well. I kind of just wish you know, they come up with some more creative finish, uh, finishes as far as to defeating him, not just him falling off the rope or, you know, something like that. I, I said something really similar about P.D. Williams in my one night only review is every time P.D. Williams is in a multi-man match, how does it end? He hits a Canadian destroyer and then someone throws him out of the ring, you know, mm-hmm. um, and they're kind of doing the same thing with Fala Bob. He's, he's losing by um, falling off the top rope or getting thrown off the top rope. Maybe that's how you beat a guy that size. I mean, maybe that's what they consider as realistic. But it just kind of seems like it's a, it's the same ending, the same finish every time we get him. I don't know what the point of this match was. I mean, you take a, you take guys that are fresh off a of feud for the tag team titles, and then it's just in a random match with Falaba. Yeah, I, I, I did find that to be weird because I thought there was still some mileage left between them and LAX because, and, and I know you had mentioned you don't really like the 50-50 booking, but, you know, you think about it, they really only had two matches where they had the one where they beat LAX and they had the title match and then that's it. Even though oftentimes I talk about I don't like random matches, I do like them at the same time because I've said many times that one of my pet peeves on a show is when you see the same matches over and over. Mm-hmm. So I like seeing different stuff, but I guess I also don't like it completely out of left field at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, g- g- give it a reason. Uh, they they bumped into each other in catering or something. I mean, just just give us kind of you know some reason to care. But after this match, we get um, we start getting these segments with Sammy Callahan and and uh, Alicia and Eddie. This to me was the best part of the show. I was hooked on these. The, uh, the the feud is just building so well. It's organic. Sammy Callahan is doing the backstage. I, th- I think it was very similar to what he envisioned his uh, Solomon Crow character was going to be doing. That's based off interviews and hearing him talk. I, I, I think he's doing now what he kind of thought he was going to do before. Um, and I think he had even said that they stole the, that idea from him for the shield. He had said that on a talk as Jericho, I think Uh-oh. that that was his idea. They told him he couldn't use it. And then the shield started using it. Uh, I don't know if that lines up. Cause I, I don't know if they all were doing the same thing at the same time. Um, I'm not really sure, but neither here nor there, but this whole thing to me, I was hooked. Like I said, um, was happy to see Alicia back on TV. Her acting was really good. Um, even Eddie's was pretty good. It just all felt really real. Felt like a little movie. It made me want to watch a final deletion between these two. But I thought it was magic. I'm I'm 100 sold on this feud. What do you got on all this? Yeah, I've been you know a big supporter of it. Just the fact that to think this all stemmed from an accident. Um, you know, this was something new. It was something unique. I will say what <laughs> one of the funny things was <laughs> when uh, when uh, um, Eddie came out after checking on Alicia and, you know, he doesn't notice that Callahan's dress up as a maid. But <laughs> how committed is Callahan to dress him as a maid? He had the <laughs> lipstick and everything, man. I was just <laughs> like, I mean, you know, the, I think the wig and the outfit would have been done enough, but, you know, doing all that. But, yeah, this this has really been great. And I know eventually the payoff, hopefully they can do something at the pay-per-view. I think that'd be, you know, a great way to blow this off, blow this feud off if, you know, they decide to. But this has been, you know, uh, another one of the things that impacts kind of just fell into and you know found some magic yeah i just i thought it was so natural and just i mean the way when he pulled the sheets off her and she's like what, what what i mean i thought Alicia was just like stellar i thought i just thought her acting was really good and natural and you know they were acting like a couple really would in that scenario and he was acting paranoid i think the one thing i didn't quite understand he had the you remember when he asked the when he um asked the housekeeper, you know, can you let me in the room? Like, what was the point of that? Because he it, he almost dressed like her, so I don't know. Like, 
did he do something to her and like kidnap her and put on her clothes? Yeah, or th that's what I was thinking. But then I also thought was he was trying to get in the room where Alicia was. I thought he was trying to say, "Oh, that was his room." Yeah, I don't know. It 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 was weird because I, I, that's what I thought originally that he was gonna take the uh, housekeeper into the room. And you know how we've seen, you know, in movies where you mug the person and you change into whatever they're wearing, but obviously you know, <laughs> tie him up in the closet. Yeah, but yeah. obviously I you know, I think that'd probably be, you know, poor image to portray. But <laughs> the one another funny thing too, like I was thinking when, when Eddie went in there, like, had you not known what was going on, tell me this didn't look like I don't know if you ever seen cheaters but <laughs> when they're trying to bust you yeah. know their mate and stuff <laughs> so you see Eddie and she's all like uh -huh. <laughs> yeah and she's all like what what are you you're freaking me out and stuff but yeah this has been nicely it's been nicely done man and um I'm looking forward to seeing what happens next I guess the the other thing I qu didn't quite get so Eddie steps out of the room so why would Sammy even dressed like he was in disguise, but then he all he did was jump him. I mean, there, there was ways you could have done that without committing to dressing like a woman. I mean, I guess to blindside him. That was, I think that was the whole the whole point of it. Yeah, I guess so. But I was I was freaking hooked. I the couple times it was on, I was like, this is freaking badass. Absolutely loved it. Next match of the evening was the X Division champion Matt Seidel against Rohit Raju. Another random match, and um, I didn't understand. So they have not de debuted the Desi Hit Squad. Now, I know you said you're a little behind on this stuff, but on Twitch and One Night Only, they've had a couple tag team matches. Um, Gersinder Singh and himself, and... Um, been victorious a couple times, but on Impact, they just, oh, the form, guy formerly known as Hakeem Zayn, they've mentioned the Desi Hit Squad, but there's no, it, this was like the wrong way, I think, to to debut the dude. I mean, you almost you almost got to re-debut, excuse me, got to almost re-debut him. He just came out one day in new pants and a new name and, and nothing, and, and you're trying to debut a stable based off this, so maybe... Maybe there's a, a, a bigger story involved, and maybe he brings them aboard. I, I don't really know, but the other thing, too, is that there's the reveal the reveal last week, and he brings out Josh Matthews, and that's his like manager. Him walking out the Grand Championship is hilarious, by the way. Um, he comes out, so Matt Seidel's a heel, Raju's a heel. Uh, I, again, we've talked about this last week. I, I don't know that the crowd necessarily knows Matt Seidel's a heel. We know watching, you know, from home. So you kind of had a heel versus heel match. Never really got to the next gear. It was just kind of there. It was one of those matches where you're just kind of like, you know, Matt Seidel is just going to hit the shooting star press here at some point. Josh Matthews was not dressed any different than he was last week. And that's that's a attention to detail that they need to work on. It wasn't dressed any different. You know, him and Matt didn't really act any different. So I like it, but there has to be more. They have to commit to it like a little bit more instead of just being themselves like turned up just a tad bit. Yeah, it's been confusing. I want to say first with Rohat uh, Raju, I probably slaughter that man's name. Apologize. You know, I watched his match. He had a previously on Explosion, where he had faced Stone Rockwell, which that's a guy I would love to see in Impact. I mean, that, <laughs> yes. that's a that's a character I can't recall. You know, I'm sure, you know, if you dial it back, you might find somebody similar. But, you know, an Explosion, fan favorite, you know, really kind of, you know, engaged with the crowd. And then, you know, we see him in Impact. And like you said, when they did the change with him, it just was so random because I thought with when he was under Hakeem Zayn, it's kind of the cocky rookie. And uh, I thought that fit him, you know. And then yeah, you, pl yeah. you place him in the stable and we hear about it through Sanjay, which at one point it had me thinking that maybe Sanjay might be a part of this. But, you know, you hear about it, but then you don't see anything. You know, you would think maybe some type of interference or whatever. But and then 
you know, when you look at Seidel and then with now uh, Josh accompanying him, there's really no follow up. Like we got the big, you know, the big debut last week that he was the spiritual advisor and, you know, there's really nothing that played up to it. And then as far as the match, just a regular standard match. I mean, there was really nothing that stood out to me. I, I thought uh, Raju, you know, was able to get a little bit in, you know, he didn't just get ran over. But, and then we see Seidel hit the shooting star press and, you know, that's it. You know, one thing I've talked, I talked about this before, but this reminded me again. So when Matt said I was going for the shooting star press, Raju starts moving into position. And this is not a knock on him. He's actually one of my favorite wrestlers, but he, there's um, a lot of people do it in every company. And if you remember back when like the macho man was going to do the elbow and that was all that was, was a freaking elbow from the top rope. He probably could have hit it from any angle he wanted to, but he always body slammed the guy into position. And Matt Seidel's actually someone in the past who has done that. Uh, one of the few to where he will, you know, might position the guy a little bit. Neville was good about that. He would kind of like drag someone because with that red arrow, you, you know, he needs him in a certain place. He would he would drag him into position, and I feel like that's like kind of a lost art. Is 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 the guy doing a move off the top rope with all the top rope moves that wrestlers do these days? It's not realistic to say, um, okay, I'm just going to jump off the rope and the guy's going to be in position. Like you got to move the dude, and when the guy starts scooching over himself, it's it, that's the kind of things that people say. Well, wrestling looks fake. I think that occurs with certain guys because I want to say, and I'll use a prime example. I remember Kidman, when uh, Kidman would hit the shooting star press, he would do kind of like a scoop slam or he would set the guy up and put them in position. But for other wrestlers, like, you know, when I'm thinking about Seidel's moveset, I can't really think of him using any kind of like suplexes or moves where he's actually like lifting the person up outside of a... Uh, uh, one off the top rope. So, uh, and I even seen notice with this match because the way that Raju was uh, positioned, he would have had to do kind of like a sideways shooting star press. So he kind of mm -hmm. rolled. And, you know, like you said, that does make it look fake. I thought uh, RVD out of everyone was probably the best where it didn't matter how you were laid on the mat. He was hitting that frog splash. He was determined. Eddie Guerrero, too. Where like and mm -hmm. maybe it's just because that move you can you know you can kind of uh, torture your body to do that, but that was one move where I know I don't care how the person lands they're gonna hit it like that. So whether it's gonna be di direct, crooked, or whatever the case may be, but you know I agree with you. I think what Seidel needs to do, even if he were to pick him up and you know do his uh, knee to the face and then have the guy fall in the place and then hit it like that, it's, it looks more realistic. Yeah, and I don't know if you saw the segment on um, Facebook after where, um, and again, let me say real quick, I think he should have a different opponent, um, maybe, and maybe there just wasn't a baby face X Division guy that they could throw to him, but I think I think Matt needed a, a statement victory here after the whole thing that happened with, with Josh, and we just didn't really get that. I think the crowd is very confused on what's going on, but there was a segment afterwards where uh, Austin Aries challenged... Uh, Matt Seidel next week, uh, title versus title, but it's the world title versus the grand championship. So I think it's safe to say that's the way they're going to write this thing off TV. That's strange. But it's a re <laughs> yeah. But it's a reminder too, to the wrestling fans. Like, I mean, God, social media, like when, when Josh Matthews won the title, Oh, and start tweeting out pictures of, um, David Arquette with the WCW title and stuff. I'm just, I, I can't say it enough to people. Just let stuff play out sometimes. I know sometimes we get in here and say, oh, what, what the hell is this? You know, we, but we always follow it up with, but let's see what happens. Let's see where it goes. You know, I look forward to seeing what happens. We, we always look at it that way. You know, we were complaining so much and I, I just keep telling people, it's like, they're just writing the title off the TV, off TV. Just let, just let it be, let it happen. Well, not even, so I think that's, Oh, so go ahead and finish. I'm sorry. No, I, I just think that's where they're going with it. I mean, I, I obviously, uh, Matt said I was not going to win the world title. So, you know, I just think that's the way they're doing it. And why, what, what better way than to have the belt collector be the last champion? Well, I think it's silly to compare 
what uh, David Arquette did to Josh Matthews because you're talking about a mid card versus the flagship title. So I think that that argument was kind kind of silly. I I seen you know fans trying to compare that, but I think where I'm confused about this is if Josh Matthews is the technically the champion, shouldn't he be facing Austin Aries? Like I I feel like that's that's kind of strange. And I mean, and like you said, since they haven't, they announced it on social media, and I actually seen earlier that they announced the match. I mean, maybe this is their way writing the belt off. I, I still don't think that that I think they're gonna keep it. I, I something there's a part of me thinks that they're gonna keep it. I, I just because they I think they need some kind of mid card belt. It's if they phase it out, you got a lot of guys in the mid card. What can they challenge for? Well, yeah, I mean, obviously they have to introduce a new title, but. I mean, the Grand Championship's not going to be that one. There's no way they're keeping it. I, I will bet anything on that. I, I, I'm, I really think they're just getting rid of it here, and they will, they will bring something else new. But I think on the Impact website, it lists Josh Matthews as a Grand Champion, but you can't give a title away if you're a champion. So I think still, still on paper, the only, the only time in wrestling history I can think of something similar was. Uh, do you remember like Lay Cool? Yeah. Like one of them, Layla was the real champion, but they broke the title in half. And they used to like, I, I man, so long ago. I think they used to like both defend it sort of, but when it came down to it, like she was still the champion on paper. So she was the one that ultimately had to lose it, even though they were like co-champions. So I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just whipping out the fake wrestling playbook here, rule book. Now, last thing, are are we are we supposed to be getting new belts soon? It's supposed to be April, and I, I it cannot come soon enough. Like <laughs> that freaking world title is the ugliest. God, <laughs> and what was embarrassing too is not. I mean, embarrassing as a fan, you know. Austin Aries posted a picture of all his titles. He didn't even have the Impact One on the top. Like he had, you know, these other titles. Two of them draped over it. But I think it was because that title's so fucking ugly. And even like the corner of the impact plate is like bent bent down a little bit, like it's dented. It's kind of like folded down because I saw I saw a close up. I'm just like, man, they just gotta get rid of that thing. <laughs> and I remember praising it so much when it was a GFW title. I was like, man, that's so sharp. I love that belt. And and that that plate is makes it the worst the worst uh belt in the world. Um Kyle was sending me former co-host <laughs> send me screenshots. He was playing like the 2K18 game, and he downloads all like like the impact. You know, cause there's people who commit to really uh, doing all the titles and the wrestlers, and they uh, they have the Impact World Title on there, and it's <laughs> it's got like the little plate on it. <laughs> um, exactly, I can real. It, it's just I got a crack uh, a kick out of this. Cracked me up. I thought it was hilarious, but. But yeah, so Austin Aries and uh, Matt Seidel next week, and um, I think do I think Josh with the belt's hilarious. That that cracks me the hell up. I don't know why people are so bothered by it. Like it's just heel heat, you know. Like, well, they act like it's never happened before. I mean, there's countless times in history where people have been given belts. I mean, in other cases, it's been people who've been wrestlers. But I know one that stuck out to me, and I admit during the time when I followed, I was pissed the hell off because i'm a big cruiserweight fan um but when they gave gave hornswoggle well he no i take that back he won it it was he had uh entered himself in a battle royal and he, yeah and, i remember that and he won the cruiserweight title and they retired it with him and that pissed yeah. me off because i'm like they let him be the last champion you know but i mean like you said we have to see how things play out and now that you know, I see that this match is being advertised, and the reason why I was asking if we get in new titles, another way they might write the belt off is maybe, you know, the winner they unify the the world in the grand championship, and then that's how they introduce a new, you know, uh, championship. Right, I can see that happening absolutely. So we've been we were we talked about that one for a long time, um, but I just want to see. I want them to kick up the the. Josh and the Matt Seidel thing up to the next level because it's just it's it's just hovering in mediocrity right now and it has the potential to be pretty good I mean you can't have if you're the spiritual advisor you can't just come out in your same clothes you know like you you gotta 
you got to do something. Found it odd that Josh Matthews, I actually thought they were going to start transitioning him, transitioning him out of the booth, which I believe they are. That's, I believe that's the plan still. But I actually didn't expect him to get back in the booth after being introduced as the manager. Like to get out of the booth to go manage the match was kind of silly in my opinion, but I can see why they did it. Uh, all night they were doing interviews with the Feaster Fired guys. I thought they were pretty good interviews. We got, you know, got to see Mackenzie Mitchell several times, so that's always a good thing. But I thought all of them were really good. The one that really stood out was the EC3 one. Just making fun of this situation because we all knew he was going to get fired. And it was almost like they played up to that. And I don't know if you looked at the um, Impact Twitter, but there was it was probably Josh tweeting, but actually some really funny... Um, Really funny tweets because, you know, we usually get the ones that insult our intelligence. Like, is EC3 going to get fired? You know, and everyone's like, seriously. But someone was actually really funny on the Twitter account. You know, they tw they even tweeted out like, oh, uh, in a moment no one ever saw coming. It was a bit written in a sarcastic voice. EC3 has been fired. For all of you who can correctly guessed, good on you, you know. But they were, they were kind of trolling that and... It, I guess it was good, you know, good lighthearted humor, whatever. So uh, after this, and Eli Drakes was hilarious when he said, I even think I was a bodyguard for a stripper and got fired for that. Yeah, no, it was some good stuff. I'll say with EC3s, <laughs> man, I, I kind of took it. They buried the hell out of him on uh, mm. here and social media. And that's one thing the company's been consistent with because sometimes you might see somebody who's departing and then us fans know where they're headed. And does the, the person still being, you know, put over big. But with this company, and I think about when uh, Kristen Cage was with the company, and this we're talking about 10 you know, years ago, where when he was on his way out, I mean, they buried the hell out of this dude. You, I forgot what what the segment was, but everybody just kind of just beat the hell out of him. So, <laughs> so like seeing this, and you know, once again, you look at it and it's to think like a couple years ago, EC3 was the guy. He was Impact Wrestling, and to see where he's at now, and obviously we know, you know, but I, my biggest takeaway from these these segments. And I'm calling it now. I had told Adam this. I'm predicting Moose is going to win the world title at Slammiversary. I think he's going to defeat Eli for it. I don't know how we're going to get there, but it's just <laughs> I, I don't know how we're going to get there to get to this could get to that point. But it's just it, that's something that I see because I just I see with Moose's promos like he's really stepped his uh, game up. I want to say ever yeah. since oh, yeah. ever since getting that win over Lashley and Eli, we know what Eli is, you know is about. And then even Petey Williams, who you know I like once again thought you know he was just going to be at the Canada tapings, and you know maybe you know he's destined just to be in the X division. But uh, yeah, that I'm going with that. I think that's going to be our slam anniversary main event. Eli defending the world title against Moose. So. That's my prediction. I think it's gonna. I think it's gonna be Alberto defending against Moose. Okay. Well, we're. I so, guess we're both consistent on Moose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I. I think for sure they need that um, next guy to step up, or they could, you know, strap a rocket to Brian Cage, which I hope they don't do. Like I hope they just kind of, um, you know, build that properly. But I, I think it's Moose's. Moose's time. I really do. And uh, you mentioned about burying, like they did, they did the same to Mike Bennett. You know, he's buried on the way out the door. And I would rather have that than what we had with Galloway, Rude, EY, Hardys being champions on their way out the door. Yeah, I will take that burial any any day of the week. Speaking of champion, um, Ali defends in a random knockouts title match against Sienna. So we haven't seen Sienna the entire set of tapings. And she um, earns herself a title match. And, you know, we knew Allie was going to win this thing. I just wish the knockouts division was a little bigger that we, you could have you thrown somebody at Allie to where she's, you know, building victories. Because she's Sienna's always kicked her ass. And now all of a sudden she beats Sienna. I wish they would have done a little bit better job. Now these are my favorite knockouts, so it was fun to watch. But... Match was a little clunky. They don't uh, 
don't seem to have a whole lot of chemistry together. It was a little clunky, in my opinion. I could not do what they do, so I'm not trying to say I could do a better job. Uh, but for me, watching from home, found it a little bit clunky. And um, there was a random spot where Allie hit a super kick, but that's her finisher now, which I'm sure she's salivating at being able to use that now that James Storm is gone, because uh, that's always been her finisher. Uh, but she, you know, she hit one um, kind of weak. And I was like, well, wow, if that's your finisher, why'd you deliver one earlier in the match that did almost nothing to her? But what do you got on the knockout title match? You know, for one, I want to say, you know, happy to see Sienna back. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I kind of think this probably would have been better if you had had Ali work with someone else and then build up to face in Sienna. And, you know, instead it just kind of seemed, because for me, th this match seemed sort of short. I mean, I you know, I was watching the next thing I know, I see Ali hit the super kick. And it seems like it was just used more for the post-match angle as opposed to actually, you know, them putting on uh, a match. Um, but, um, yeah, it 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 kind of just seemed kind of just, like you said, random. <laughs> so Allie gets the victory, and um, Braxton Sutter comes out. This, to me, was was hilarious. And I know we talked about this before. We both found this funny. I think Braxton is killing it as a heel. I know some people really don't agree with that. But it's, it's kind of a, like a funny, goofy heel, heel but he's very natural. I, I've said it a hundred times. He's got more charisma than we were seeing as the babyface. And I think he's shown it to us now. But with the way he came out and boo, boo. And, uh, and, and like I pointed out last week, that's what he calls her in real life. Coming out and acting like he's trying to get her back now. And on the one night only taping, he, he called himself the residential residential heartbreaker or something like that. So I don't know what they're trying to do with him exactly, but I kind of like it. He cuts this promo on one night only, by the way, where he goes out there and he starts playing to the can you know Canadian crowd. It's only two things I hate more than can you know, um, Canada or whatever it is. Like he's getting, you know, getting him riled up. And then he says, in a real cheesy, with a real cheesy laugh, he's like, you know, Allie's like a little bunny, more like a duckbill platypus. Ha 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 No, but seriously, Windsor, you suck. And the way he, he delivered that last part, I thought freaking was badass. Like, it was real natural. But it made me laugh because I didn't, I didn't see it coming. I'm laughing at what he's doing. I, I don't know if everyone else is. I think some people are not. I think it's freaking hilarious. Gets down on one knee, like he's gonna propose to Allie, and Sue Young comes. So I, you, the camera angle actually showed her in the. You could see her briefly walking through the crowd. I gotta say, Sanjay, Josh did a good job too. Sanjay delivered this really well. In the fact that he's like, yeah, I know who that is, and then you know that's Sue Young, and da 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 da. And then later, Josh like, yeah, I know Sue Young from this and this. As opposed to when Hanaya came out and JB sold that like a sack of shit. You know, is that Hanaya? Like, Hanaya is not that popular. Don't. It was so, so bad. So bad when JB did it. But this felt really good. And, and, and you know, it, it was delivered in a way where like, okay, we should kind of know who she is. But, you know, you're, you're not treating us like we're dumb. They're not acting dumb, but they're acting kind of surprised. Oh, damn. Yeah, yeah, I've seen her before. So what do you got on the Braxton segment and then uh, the uh, post-match attack with Sue Young? As far as the Braxton segment, man, I probably laughed so hard. I'm sure my neighbors heard. I just thought this was so it was so hilarious. And, you know, it's it's a shame that they couldn't find, you know, to use him like this earlier you know sooner i'm sorry um yeah i think the hill his hill work is you know way better than obviously his face work um obviously you know down the road they're gonna have to find something else for him to do you know but for right now this works and i think he's capable to do more especially work in the mid card um as far as the debut for sue young i thought it was nicely done but i'll tell you at first i was kind of a little bit worried because i felt like her character seems there's some sort of similarities to Rosemary's. So I kind of thought like, man, maybe that'll be a problem. But then towards the end, after she attacked Allie, it looked, 
and tell me if you agree or not, it looked like if she was kind of playing like a, a schizophrenic character, which I thought was cool, you know, cool because that's that's something you know we haven't seen since you know we're talking about you know mid '90s with um, Mankind. So I just thought I was like, okay, I'm I'm interested to see what happened, you know, happens next between her and Allie. What, what, but what do you, what did you think of her character? Do you think it's too similar to Rosemary's, or do you think it's something totally different? Well, whatever it is, she's trying to be out there. She does a killer job of it. I've seen her wrestle a lot with Shine, but you know, there's not a lot of storyline to Shine, so I never really totally understood her character. There's definitely similarities, but. You know, if, even if you think of Rosemary's heel work, it was a very different character than the Sue Young one. Like it was, it was the, it was more like the Harley Quinn type of thing. Um, and now she's like, if it was heel Rosemary, I could see like, okay, damn, they're really freaking similar. But babyface Rosemary isn't is other than the face paint, they're pretty different to me. I mean, they they've watered down. I shouldn't say the term watered down, but Rosemary's character has lightened up quite a bit. You know, there's even some humor to her a little bit. I think they would make for a really good feud, but I don't think they're I don't think they're too similar. I can see the similarities, but I but I don't really know. I, I'm not really tracking on what she's supposed to be. But I will say this. The the attacking the champion thing is starting to get Date like debuting by like coming through the crowd attacking the champion like it's getting a little old that whole thing um I, I just wish they could find some new ways to to debut people just more creative you know we just saw Hanaya jump Rosemary not that long ago and they did the same exact thing I mean why don't they just go do the route that we've seen before where you could even had her in uh, interfere in the match and she just attacked both Sienna and Allie. You know, you could have could have done something like that. There's, you know, different ways or backstage segments. I mean, there are different ways to to um, debut someone. Because here, here's the thing. I guess here's a big thing. Not that I have a problem with it, but her attacking the champion. I mean, is she next in line for a title shot? It's just like she just she just arrived. You know, so <laughs> yeah. you know, but. I'm I'm really interested to see because like I said uh, when after the attack, you know I seen her like she was kind of had her hands like on her head like kind of like uh, kind of a it was reminding me of like that schizophrenic character that mankind yeah. should portray which I thought I was like okay this is different that's 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 awesome, but uh, yeah they they you know I for and I'll give Impact credit you know with these tapings and everything it's been wonderful but there's little things like as far as and, and then we even seen with uh, Austin Aries that shirt <laughs> when, I, when I see them come out I yeah. thought about that shirt there's little things of detail that you know they gotta kind of uh, tweak and improve on yeah so but there's similar similarities but Rosemary is in another league as far as a character um and I, I hope they don't rush a feud between the two of them. I hope they don't like try to feed Rosemary to her while she's on the quest for the knockouts title. Um, I, it just it just dawned on me what they're trying to do. I think they're what they're going to try to do with this is rehash the Allie and Rosemary storyline from the indies a little bit. Mm -hmm. Because you can't really do that on Impact now. Rosemary's character is, if you didn't do it while she was with Decay, like you can't do it now. She's like I said, her her character's just lightened up. There's even a little comedy to her, um, brighter colors. I mean, she's she's very different than the Decay Rosemary. So I think this character is a little um, similar to that Courtney Rush a little bit. And you know, they did the whole Demon Slayer feud and everything. I think they're trying to relive that a little bit. That's that's kind of my gut instinct on this, which could work. Yeah, I, I always thought that was the uh, end game. Was the moment that Ali was gonna you know, become champion, that they were gonna try to work their way to you know having that feud. Now I don't know if it would be both of them being babyface or you have Rosemary turn heel, but I think it could work either either way. But I always thought that that was the money feud. It would be it would be too difficult to to um, turn Rosemary heel. I, I don't I don't think anyone would boo her. I just. You know, I think this is the character we're getting going forward. She's just she's just really over. So 
I'm going to assume that some people are going to say, oh, well, the crowd was dead for Sue Young out there. You know, this is where companies like Ring of Honor and stuff um, kind of spoil the, I don't say spoil, but kind of almost ruin things with the wrestling audience because they're just cheering for everything. When a character like Sue Young comes out there, it should be quiet. It should be pin drop. You, you, should, you should be able to hear a pin drop with a character like that because you should be like, wow, like what is what is she doing? Like, you don't need to be booing and you don't need to cheer. Like, you know, even like last year when Scott Steiner came out, everyone's like, Oh, no one did it. It's like, what are they supposed to do? Cheer for him? Like he's, he's a bad guy. Yeah. So, um, you should be in awe kind of, and that's, that's how I took it. That's how I, I thought it came across. And, um, I, I can just see where some people will be like, Oh, well they didn't react to her. Like you kind of shouldn't, but, um, and that finisher, she, I don't know if it's her finisher, but, um, that looked that looked pretty painful in Ali's head. Yeah, I know. I and I didn't know if that's how the move is supposed to go because I've seen it be performed. Because uh, it's essentially the miracle in progress what Bennett used to use, but I, you know, the way that she had ended it, you know, I don't know if that's just her touch, but yeah, I'm interested to see. I think you know her coming out. I think the whole purpose and they were able to accomplish that is people were trying to analyze what happened, you know, who's this? And that's kind of like the missed art in wrestling. You know, nowadays everyone wants to know everything like, oh, that's such and such. Yeah, such and such is coming out tonight. Oh, such and such debuted and da 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 da. You know, where now, you know, you got some fans who aren't familiar with her, like, oh, well, this this girl came in, you know, dark character came in and attacked Allie. Who is it? You know, let's catch next week and see the follow up. So. GWN match. This is becoming my like bathroom break. Um, the, uh, we've already said it. The, the matches are too long. They give us a actually a pretty good Monsters Ball match. Um, it was a match that I thought should have ended with the taser. You know, when he kind of kicked out after that, I thought that was kind of silly. But I thought the match should have ended at that point. But it was a good Monsters Ball match. It was. It was. There was blood. There were some innovative spots. Um, Daphne came out who's sexy. It was a really well done match. And I was like, I guarantee this is a lot better than what we're going to get in the main event. <laughs> as far as, you, you know what I mean? And, and you just see the crowd popping for everything. And when I say better, it's just because they did some innovative stuff for that McFoley and Abyss one that I knew wasn't going to happen in this match. I just, I just knew it wasn't. I knew it was going to most likely kind of be the same spots that, they always do. And Abyss usually takes the same spots. And we'll get to the main event, obviously, in a little bit. But, yeah, I'm kind of done with this GWN stuff. I hope that they are um, getting a lot of feedback on the surveys. And I hope next set of tapings they dr dramat <laughs> drastically change um, how they're going to deliver that. Because there there's a better way to market your app without giving us an entire match. So you got anything on that at all? No, I just agree. Um, and I actually, on the most recent survey, I had actually made a comment. I said, you know what? With the GWN flashback, just uh, shorten it a little bit. Show us the beginning, middle, end of matches. Don't give us the full match. You know, that's what you know the app is for. And I, that's all I think they should do. I mean, and with this and... And, you know, now that you mentioned it, I didn't even catch all of it because so, I actually was going to say, oh, well, the flashback was actually short because I seen the part where Abyss had fell. I want to say he fell off the table or something. And I don't know if I didn't, you know, miss it or whatever, uh, but uh, I was like, dang, that was short. But, yeah, I agree with you. They need to find a better way to present this. I thought the spot though with with Daphne going through the table was really or was the, not through the table but it was through the uh, barbed wire boards but in true like I'm gonna say in TNA fashion because a lot of TNA cameras in the past used to miss the good spots like you would see it you would kind of see it going on in the background but you wouldn't see the whole thing and they miss a lot of really good angles and this was kind of it, it kind of shows that they've actually come back I mean um done a lot better with that because th that's what happened with this one like it was this badass spot and we didn't even really get to see it we just kind of heard it and the people responded to it too but i actually thought mick foley should have won that match but um abyss wins and we talked about this last week abyss is having you know, and we're going to discuss it again later abyss is not he's having a hard time moving around 
And in this match, you could see he was getting around just fine. So that's kind of one of the reasons, too. I was like, well, I guarantee this is going to be better than what we see later. So the Monsters Ball match, speaking of which, Abyss versus Congo Kong. This was a very popular segment on YouTube. Um, it had 300,000 hits in the first 23 hours, which was well beyond anything else that uh, they put out. So this is kind of the second time. And I, we talked about this in the interview with Congo Kong. Like the Grandma Jenny segment, this one, like Congo Kong is getting a lot of hits. This storyline is getting a lot of hits. People were into it. Now with this Monsters Ball match, I thought some good things happened. We, we said last week, this needs to be a match where Congo Kong like steps up. I thought he was... I thought he was going to go for the moonsault yeah, me on too. the table. Me too. That would have been amazing. That would have blown the roof off the place. Um, and maybe they're saving a spot like that for another time, but I, I thought this would have been a good opportunity for it. But overall, you know, a lot of the kind of same spots we see, but it was cool to see Congo Kong in a match like this, see Congo Kong in a main event. And um, he gets the victory uh, with the splash off the top. You know, Janice came out. Janice never hits its intended target, <laughs> but um, you know, it's still it's still like a good pop. You know, uh, oh, it's Janice. Whoa, and and uh, you know, James Mitchell did his thing, and it was um, it was cool. What do you got on Monsters Ball? You know, I thought that Congo Kong delivered, and you know, I will give Abyss credit to given his status now, where you know he's not moving like he, the old Abyss. I mean, he did what he was supposed to do. He put Congo Kong over, and I I really think, and I'm not gonna say this was some you know masterpiece by far, but it, it me as a fan, it really had me looking forward to what's next with Congo Kong because. You know, we had seen him, you know, for the past six months doing kind of the same stuff or, you know, you know, being tied up with Laurel and other things. So now there's actually a direction. You have Jimmy Jacobs as his manager and then you hate you have him face the old resident monster of Impact Abyss and defeating Abyss in Abyss's own match. So I, I really th thought this put Congo Kong in a good light and I'm looking forward to see what plans they have for him next. It was funny on Twitter they posted a poll like who's gonna win? And it was like seventy percent Abyss and I was just like, does anyone really think Abyss is gonna win this match? <laughs> you know, it there there's a it's had a a very steady build, a nice build, but why would Abyss win the match? That would have Congo Kong's character would have taken like twenty steps back if he lost this match. It would have been like, okay, so what? Where do we go from here? What you know? So now we look at Congo Kong, be like, okay, now he's gonna take the next step, and I think that's really exciting because in wrestling we don't see those big guys like in the main event scene anymore, or you know, um, I always call it like the Big Show effect. Like he ruined it for big guys with all the turns and and everything, you know, playing a you know, uh, menacing character one week and the next week coming out with Kool-Aid smiles. And I think that's really hurt big men in wrestling. Now, granted, he, not that many people are their size, but I just don't think people, a lot of fans take heavyweights that serious now in the main event picture. And I think they're going that way with Congo Kong. Like, I think, I think we could see a title run at some point. I really do. Um, and that would be something very different. And um, they would have to build up to it very well but but uh you know it, it was a, it was an okay match but for for me it's kind of like you i'm i'm glad to see congo Kong get over and, and see what uh what he does next i think you know with him and the addition of brian cage it does you know assuming that they're in the main event in the foreseeable future it gives impact a different um that el different element because you know past few months we've kind of seen the same sort of guys i mean obviously with johnny impact he's more of a flashy type then we got alberto and uh eli drake who are more kind of the showman type and then we just got austin aries and so when you get somebody like a brian cage who's just this massive dude and even lashley too i'm sorry forgot about him you know but brian cage is massive dude who can just pretty much toss anyone and then you add a uh, Congo Kong to the mix. That's a nice crop of uh, main event uh, main eventers that you have. I hope that they really kick it up with this main event scene going forward and just give us some new some new faces. Like we've seen Johnny Impact have like nine title shots. Like let's see him move on. I don't know who they would 
pit him up with, but just some different uh, faces. So the briefcase reveal, this is one of those things, again, we've talked about this so many times. Like, So this was the main event, but there's always certain main events. Like they're not going to go off the air with Congo Kong. You know, just like I used to say, they're not going to go off the air with Eli Drake or Johnny Impact. They're only going to go off the air with Alberto El Patron. You know, like they're going off the air this time with Brian Cage. They have certain people who they will not close the show with. Same thing happened here. Um, the main event happens, and then we get the Feast or Fire reveal. So this was done a lot different than the last time we saw this. Um, I'm talking about the one where Grado was fired. You know, it was you know, dramatic. It was behind closed doors, and there was music and all that stuff. And you know, now they did it in the ring, and we see Jeremy Borash's goofy ass again. They do these... They always happen the same way. You know what I mean? Like, you know, the fire briefcase is not going to be one of the first two because then it would just like, that's the most dramatic briefcase. Like there's never going to be a scenario where like the first person is fired and then the fourth person opens up as the X division, you know, they always deliver it a certain way. And I wish there was a different way they could do it, but maybe there just isn't, I don't know. And, um, we, we called that, that, P.D. Williams was going to win the X Division one. I mean, that's was so obvious. Eli Drake gets the tag team title one. He's pissed off. He said, who do I even win with? I don't, or, you know, win these titles with. I don't even have a partner. And he just uh, throws it out of the ring. So I thought that was actually really good. Um, I think that's something a lot of people aren't talking about the next day, even though that's one of the better parts of the segment. And then we have uh, EC3 and Moose. Moose opens it and has a global championship match. Did you catch that? Yeah, even though they had uh, expl- uh, said it was a world title shot, I mean it was just <laughs> a little error. I mean, you know, I think you know I kind of figured a lot of fans they'd catch it but move on. But I mean, I'm sure there's some that it, that was like, oh, oh my god, like you know, it happens. Especially in this company, it happens. <laughs> like- <laughs> so um, Moose is gonna uh, challenge for the world title. I think it's going to be real similar to we we both believe that he's going to be in the title picture for a while. I think it's going to be really similar to the Johnny Impact thing. Like I think he's going to have a lot of opportunities, and uh, eventually will win it, just like Johnny will eventually win it. EC3, we all saw this coming. I uh, couldn't wait for this. I couldn't wait for them to get EC3 off TV. But at the same time, when I knew when that was like those closing seconds, I was like, oh my god, don't go. <laughs> I was like, damn, I'm going to miss EC3. But uh, but for, for the sake of the storylines and the sake of the company and not, you know, tweeting his pictures out and stuff, I was really, uh, I'm ready for him to go. So he gets the uh, fire briefcase. And I thought everything he did from that point out was great. The way that he was in denial, his character. Like, I wish we saw that kind of passion from him over the last several months. The way he committed to that, I wish he would have, you know, committed to a couple of other things. Random, random, uh, random statement here. Do you remember at Bound for Glory, he won with that, uh, what he called the ECD? Yeah. We never saw that again. <laughs> yeah, no. And I someone, noticed. someone posted a, um, a little video on Facebook. I guess he's using the TK3 as his finisher in, in, um, NXT. Oh, wow. Which, I think he, I think that move is awful. I, you know, there's so many times he delivered that move and it was sloppy and maybe it's not his fault, but I don't think they like that move in WWE. The, uh, I don't even know what you call it. Head, headlock. Yeah. Cause, you, uh, you know, what's his name used to do it. I think at one point and then he, he, he got away from it as well and ended up using a uh, cactus Jack's finisher. Uh, Ambrose, yeah. Ambrose, Ambrose was, did. It was just because they said it wasn't a move he could pull out out of nowhere. That was the whole point where they said, we don't want that. We need something you can just like slap on and nail it if you needed to. I do know Adam had a criticism of it that, you know, it wasn't being protected. And I, I what I've noticed, you know, in the later part of his time in Impact, he wasn't even really getting it all the way. Like when he was connecting on it, he'd get in like halfway there. So I had thought they had phased the move out a little bit because even there was one point in in time where he was using, I want to say the million dollar dream or he was using some sort of submission. So he he was coming up, trying to come up with another move. 
And, you know, personally, I never really cared for the move. I like it off the top rope, obviously. But I just don't, I just thought of somebody of his stature. I mean, you know, power bomb or something like and i mean i know i know a lot of people use power bombs but i thought that would fit him more and even when he changed to that uh, that driver you know i thought like okay it's different but um i kind of figured too i didn't think it was something that he was going to use long term just because you know you got to be able to lift people up for that but yeah you know watching this you know it's just like it's crazy like how you know you think back when he came on board he was really somebody you know say a homegrown talent and you know throughout the years and through the changes you could say you know creative failed him in some parts and he was mismanaged but i i feel like towards the end you know even though you we can say that he checked out it's like he didn't really have a place with the new impact vision anymore like it i don't know maybe it's just me but like he didn't fit in anymore and like i said you can say maybe that's creative not finding the right place for him but you know seeing him leave i hope he's able to obtain the same success that he was in impact i kind of doubt it just because i feel like with his character over where he's going there's so many people that kind of have that kind of you know that body guy you know cocky image so it's really hard to break through but you know i wish him the best i did like him beating jeremy borash with the briefcases or the briefcase so i like that um i like seeing jeremy borash getting his ass whooped <laughs> because um i uh he jeremy borash did a lot for the company but i really feel i don't like the way he left um He's the last person in the world you think would just one day be like, hey, I'm I'm going to WWE, buy Like, Jeremy Borash, of all people, really, that you've been through that shit for countless years. People, you know, screwing the company over or using the company. or Like, anyway, uh, that's for another day. <laughs> but, um, yeah, good sec. You know, you could tell EC3 was, was fairly emotional about it, too. Um, it's definitely something that he was excited to move on, but... It's hard to say goodbye also. And Brian Cage gets a rub. Brian Cage comes out, lays EC3 out, and we got Brian Cage standing tall. So at least EC3 did the right thing on the way out the door. Um, he didn't totally ignore the company either. You know, he was tweeting at them and everything um, after the show. He even promoted a couple of the matches here and there. Uh, not to the extent of Laurel. Um, she's I think she gained a lot of people's respect in the way she was uh committed to promoting the company all the way to the very end but you know ec3 it's gonna be hard it's gonna be hard not seeing him anymore um it was a little painful to see him not get used correctly for a little while but we're just moving on and you're right the, the new vision just didn't have that um i mean the new management didn't have that vision for him just that's the way it is i like that he uh name dropped dixie carter <laughs> I'm Dixie Carter's nephew. <laughs> yeah. You know, hey, let me ask you too. Um, and cause there was, I want to say the guy's name was second royalty. He had left a comment about this last week. Do you think this is the end of the feast or fired? Cause I was of the mindset that this was probably their way of getting EC3 off TV while, um, setting up some contenders for the titles. Cause you know, we really, after the crossroads event, we really didn't know what was next for, you know, as far as who the champions next challengers were. So they were able to, you know, knock out everything at once. But do you think this is the end of the Feaster Fired match? I don't know. Um, just the fact that they did it in the ring, which, you know, a couple of years ago, like the way they just committed to a backstage segment and drama and everything. And then now it was like they just did it in the ring. It, that's almost shows the signs of like, ah, we're just, we're kind of done with this. We're just gonna, you know, do it. So it could be, but I mean, it's, it's a good way to write people off TV. So, um, I don't really know. I, I like that EC3 was saying, um, you know, a guy who, who carried the company on his perfectly chiseled back for four years, doesn't get fired this way. Someone who's a two time world champion and beat every hall of famer doesn't get fired this way. I mean, the whole thing was really good. Yeah, I mean, like I said, it, it's tough, but I mean, you know, what can you do? And, you know, the one thing, and not to you know, be critical of anyone who leaves, because, you know, I'm all for, you know, people pursuing a better opportunity. 
but you know there comes a point like and I'll, I'll use a comparison like you know you know I, I know you and I we talk basketball a lot but when you think about somebody signing with your team you know you you want a guy who wants to say win championships not looking for the big contract and I think that's with impact with some of the people that they get you know, I look for people who, you know, want to be the, the faces of Impact, be champions in Impact versus trying to get that big contract. Now, while I know, you know, personal finances, family and whatnot, you have to take care of that. But, you know, so we're, we're seeing for some that, you know, that's what's important to, important to them. So, you know, going to Impact, being able to achieve what you can achieve is cool. But, I mean, to you know, they'll risk going somewhere else where they might not be utilized nowhere near the same capacity as long as, you know, their bank account's right. And that that's fair. You know, there there's no problem with that, but that's just kind of one of the things. So, you know, when these people come on board, some of them, you know, we got to just enjoy them and hope that, you know, they use it, utilize their time best and impact. So then when they leave, you know, we can wish them well and then we're on to the next person. So next week's show looks really good. We're getting Brian Cage versus Lashley. We're getting Matt Seidel versus Austin Aries champion versus champion. And we're getting Sue Young debut match. So I would imagine they're going to get, you know, pull out Amber Nova or something like that. Uh, they could they could probably use Alicia at this point. But, I mean, she's already in an angle uh, with Eddie. And, and they use Alicia very well. They utilize her very well as far as capitalizing on being Eddie's wife and, um, you know, tugging at his heartstrings. But, um, that's completely random that I said that, but, um, I would imagine we're probably going to get Amber Nova or something like that. Um, and I have to remind people, she is not a knockout people. <laughs> I laugh on social media. Amber Nova is one of my favorite knockouts. She's not a knockout. <laughs> um, but it, it looks like a good show. Um, this, this show was okay. It just, it just didn't have anything, you know, to write home about, but there was the Braxton Sutter thing we thought was funny. There was the uh, Feaster Fire where, you know, EC3 was pretty memorable at the end. So there was moments, but it was just an episode that was just kind of there. It felt almost like the one night only in Twitch shows that I just watched. It was it was just there. Uh, random matches that meant nothing. So hopefully we don't get any of that going forward because we do got a pay-per-view to build up to. That is going to do it. For us this week, do you got any closing thoughts or comments on Impact this week or Impact in general? Um, I don't know if, uh, if you had – did you announce our, that we're getting Lashley and uh, Brian Cage as well? Yeah. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. I, I didn't catch that part. No, um, you know, like you said, it had moments. I thought this show – it was a nice lead-up show to next week. I think advertising the two biggest matches as far as we're getting the title versus title and the Lashley versus Cage – that's going to be enough to get people to want to tune in. So, I mean, hopefully next week's show is, you know, stellar as well. I mean, but, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right, so thanks for listening. I know we ran uh, kind of long today. This is this a long show, so uh, apologies. It wasn't even that eventful of a show to talk <laughs> so much about, but, um, you know, we'll try to try shorten it up next time. So, for Roe, this is BQ. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next time. Peace.